<laughs> Hello. <laughs> so now it's time for our keynote speaker. And now we're going to have here Marcel Kolaya, and he's going to talk about regulatory state of play of open source in the EU. Can you hear me? Wonderful. Um, so my name is Marcel Kolaya. Um, oh, I am um, the member and uh, quester of the European Parliament and uh, first vice president of the Czech Pirate Party. Um, before uh, you will enjoy this um, conference, I am going to tell you something about the regulatory state of play of open source in the Union. Um, uh, I apologize um, if um, at, during the course of the presentation you will become a bit depressed, but let's, <laughs> let's see what we can do about that. So um, just a very short uh, intro, as I said, I am a, um, a member and a quester of the European Parliament. Um, I got elected in uh, uh, 2019 and um, um, just for you to understand my focus, the work in the European Parliament is organized in committees. I am in the Internal Market and Consumer Protection Committee and the CULT, um, uh, uh, which is Culture and Innovation, uh, sorry, Culture and Education Committee. Um, and also, uh, I am in a, a temporary committee to investigate uh, the Pegasus scandal. Uh, so, so this is the committees in which I work, so that, that's basically the angle uh, from which I look uh, at the legislation. And uh, well, given that uh, I had been uh, working in IT for two decades before I became a member of the European Parliament, it's very logical that also my focus uh, in the legislative work is on uh, the digit digital agenda, on digital topics, um, uh, of course, uh, free and open source software among them. Um, and uh, my other areas are also uh, touch upon um, openness of the institution, transparency, and also freedom uh, of press. So now, so applications uh, basically is the only thing that the, the user can see in the end. Um, the operating system is extremely important, but without the application, the, the operating system has no purpose. So, um, building an application um, ecosystem in open source is also very important in order to demonstrate that uh, open source represents a viable alternative. Um, in order uh, to do that, uh, also we need to pay attention to the, the regulatory um, system, the legal framework uh, that allows, or in the best case scenario, incentivizes actually uh, the free and open source software ecosystem uh, to grow. So uh, first, we need to make sure that free and open source software principles are not undermined by uh, the legal framework, uh, so that technologies um, continue to empower people exactly in the spirit of free software, that everyone can run uh, the software as they wish, can modify it, uh, can uh, uh, share the uh, modified versions of it, and um, uh, that collaboration helps to bring new ideas. Now second, we also need a consistent and predictable legal framework so that different um, initiatives, uh, different legislative in initiatives do not actually contradict each other. Um, 
that we have a clarity for business and for, for, for consumers alike, uh, alike under which condition the rules apply, they, they need to know. So uh, the uh, European Union, all right. So uh, the European Union um, set an ambitious, ambitious objective for itself in um, the digital strategy that is called Shaping Europe's Digital uh, Future. Um, the Union wants to lead um, in the initiative uh, for a healthier planet and um, also um, wants to lead on digital innovations in the uh, new digital world. So I would like to quote a bit from, from that um, so that you understand what is basically the starting point from the strategy, uh, strategic perspective. So this is a quote from the Shaping Europe's Digital Future. We want a European society powered by digital solutions that are strongly rooted in our common values and that enrich the lives of all of us. People must have the opportunity to develop personally, to choose freely and safely, to engage in society regardless of their age, gender or professional background. Businesses need a framework that allows them to start up, scale up, pool and use data, to innovate and compete or cooperate on fair terms. And Europe needs to have a choice and pursue the digital transformation in its own way. European technological sovereignty starts from ensuring the integrity and resilience of our data infrastructure, networks and communications. It requires creating the right conditions for Europe to develop and deploy its own key capabilities, thereby reducing our dependency on other parts of the globe for the most crucial technologies." End of quote. So here we can see that there is a wish to achieve technological sovereignty and give the opportunity to business, to start up and uh, to scale up. But also there is a wish to guarantee safety, uh, that people are safe, um, that people are protected online. And here, I must say that this often um, leads to legislation failing um, in um, creating the promised innovation-friendly environment. Uh, for instance, uh, because um, the focus very often is only on one possible innovation and business model um, that, um, you know, uh, where safety and security regulations are basically tailored to big companies only. Um, because there is a lack uh, of an ambition um, on opening the market for smaller players and also non-proprietary solutions. Now, This is the positive part, this is not the depressive one, that comes <laughs> later. Anybody heard of the Digital Markets Act? A couple of hands, that's cool. All right, so the Digital Markets Act <clears throat> is a legislation, or maybe before I start with that, um, just to introduce what I will be speaking um, about in the, in the, in the following minutes. Um, so I need to say that the, the European par pirates, you know, have been working really hard in the European Parliament uh, to raise awareness about technology in general, including free and open source software, or I would say especially because, well, there's many politicians who actually see the opportunities in technology and um, digital solutions, but not everybody uh, always has free and open source software in their minds. Um, so, so here we can see that we are already seeing some impact, um, which, is, which is what I would like to speak about now. So the, so the Digital Markets Act. So the Digital Markets Act is a legislation um, aimed at tackling the issue of uh, big tech companies having uh, an enormous impact on some of the digital markets. But basically, 
abusing their dominant position um, and uh, creating an environment where smaller players can only uh, compete in that market if they abide by the rules that are set by these large corporations that in the legislation are called uh, gatekeepers. Um, now, um, I said that they abuse their position. Well, that is sometimes tackled uh, ex post. So uh, sometimes they get a fine uh, here and there um, that you know, tackles the fact that they abuse their position. So that goes basically according to competition law. The issue with this approach is that first, it does not scale to the number of cases that we've been seeing. A second, it is incredibly slow. So it takes years for a dec decision to be taken whether a dominant position is abused or not, which of course is not really gr great from the perspective of innovation and um, you know, smaller companies uh, competing on the market because as much as the gatekeepers can uh, survive a, um, a couple million euro fine, uh, the smaller companies may not survive three years of taking the decision whether a position is being abused or not. Um, here, uh, however, um, what I have seen in that legislation, I worked on this legislation, and what I have seen there is, well, there is a lack of ambition uh, because one of the major issues that we see on the digital market were, um, were the dominant position of certain uh, players on the market uh, goes against um, the possibility to create uh, competing solutions or the competing solutions to, um, uh, to take traction is so-called network effects. So this is apparently the case in um, messaging services. This is apparently the case with social networks where not everybody, um, I would say, is on the major platforms because they are the best but usually because their friends are there and um, you know, their grandma is there and uh, their business partners are there. So in order to switch from, let's say, WhatsApp to Matrix, it's not sufficient to, to make your own decision, but you have to convince also your grandma, your friends, and your business partners, which, I mean, it's very clear that it's impossible. So. And what I have proposed is an interoperability clause that uh, requires, for, um, requires that these gatekeepers provide interoperability uh, towards others if they wish, if others wish, so they can interconnect and you can have a seamless interoperable experience between, let's say, WhatsApp and Matrix if um, uh, I have already used that example. On social networks, we have a review clause um, that says that the commission has to review in a couple of years whether this is something that they would also want to see extended to, the, uh, to social networks. And this is the law now, so, so now we will see the implementation of that. Now, in order to continue in the spirit of the Digital Markets Act, I have also proposed a pilot project that is called Demonopolizing Access to EU Applications. Uh, first, what is a pilot project? So every member of the European Parliament has this um, opportunity uh, to get a chunk of um, um, a, the, the European budget that is attributed to a particular project. It's called a pilot project. And it's basically a framework uh, that aims at testing new policy initiatives. Uh, so basically before the Commission proposes anything, well, this is a way how to, um, how to test whether it actually makes sense. Um, so, so this pilot project that I have proposed and it was then approved by the Parliament and by the Council and by the Commission and everyone, the Commission now has to uh, implement it, um, is exactly in the sense of the Digital Markets Act where we spoke about, um, well, 
it's not really great if some markets are occupied completely by uh, just the large corporations. However, the European institutions, they also develop applications. But um, first, according to the principle public money, public code, I think all of us agree that such applications should be open source software. But that is not sufficient. Because where do you get these applications? Well, the answer is on Google Play and Apple App Store. That's not really in the spirit of the Digital Markets Act. So that's why I have initiated this pilot project. And now uh, the commission will need to implement offering uh, these applications on alternative uh, app stores or repositories, including uh, AppDroid, for instance. Um, the other project, um, I always forget what exactly is the name um, because it's uh, the abbreviation that it is usually called is FOSEPS, which is, stands for Free and Open Source Software Solutions for European Public Services. And that pilot project basically um, advances the idea of wide cooperation in Europe. So it has three uh, concrete actions. First is building the first Europe-wide open source solutions catalog for uh, public administration. Second, identifying critical software used by Euro European public services and, and three, forming a European public services user group on open source. So here, apparently, the aim is you know, to share experience and to make the most use out of open source in public administration. Third, um, the Interoperable Europe Act. And here it starts to be a bit shaky. Um, that is legislation proposed by the Commission where the Commission basically acknowledges the need to digitize public administration and aims at establishing an interoper interoperability governance structure uh, and co-creating an ecosystem of interoperable solutions. Sounds great, right? Now, this is a great step forward indeed. Um, unfortunately, I'm afraid that it lacks ambition on free and open source software because the Interoperable Europe Board will recommend interoperable solutions for the cross-border interoperability of network and information systems used by public administration. However, it's only optional for the board to propose to the Commission free and open source software solutions. So here, apparently, we have a gap that uh, we need to fill. Now, this was the positive part. Um, here comes a bit of, um, yeah, a, a number of warnings. So first, the AI Act, on which I also work. Um, anybody knows about the AI Act or? Okay, a number of people doesn't know about the Artificial Intelligence Act. So basically, the Artificial, Artificial Intelligence Act is, um, I would say, a fairly logical, a step by the European Commission to create a, a, a legal framework for the use and development of artificial intelligence. Given that this technology uh, is extremely revolutionary and um, can um, really uh, be a benefit for the society, but at the same time, also there is a risk with using artificial intelligence. Uh, as an example, I mean, um, one of the most controversial points is, for instance, uh, remote biometric identification, such as facial recognition um, in cameras um, in, in the public space. So basically, identifying everyone uh, uh, all the time uh, does not really seem to be a um, much better society than Orwellian 1984. So mm, what the commission has done I think rightfully, is that they said, well, we, n we don't want to regulate technology, we want to regulate uses. So it structures the uses of artificial intelligence. By the way, the sole definition of artificial intelligence was a point of uh, really lengthy discussions. Um, <laughs> uh, so it structures the uses 
uh, according to the risk of the use. And the low risk, which the commission assessed in the impact assessment to like 85% of the uses, not really relevant from the legislation point of view. The 15% is more interesting because that's a high risk category and, and there, there are um, certain uh, conditions that need to be met during uh, the development, during uh, the deployment, and during the use of such artificial intelligence. Um, right, um, then, and then we have some sort of like at the tip of the pyramid where the commission said, well, this should be banned. Like social credit score system as we know from China. Um, well, here, I think it all in all goes in the right direction. Uh, the problem is when you start, you know, thinking about free and open source software, what is the impact on that? So um, there is an exception from obligations under uh, the Act for High Risk Applications while it is not placed in the market or service. Um, so, well, I have pushed a lot for exception for free and open source software because we don't really you know, want to uh, destroy the innovation that also uh, like with a grassroots type of movement comes uh, from a lot of people who well actually maybe have some free time in the evening code something and put it on the internet and say look well this is something interesting I have done. Well maybe it's a uh, complete bullshit, maybe it's even dangerous, but I mean, uh, nobody forces anyone to use it. And maybe it will be a great idea that somebody else will take up and um, innovate on top of that. Um, that type of thinking we will see in uh, the subsequent uh, pieces of legislation uh, where I believe that we really need to work on that a bit more. Now. A bit different piece of legislation is regulation laying down rules to prevent and combat child sexual abuse, um, which is something what we definitely want to do to um, fight uh, child sexual abuse. However, how the commission proposed it, I don't really think it goes in the right direction because, well, who is aware of this le legislative initiative, by the way? Okay, many people, perfect. So. So the main problem um, there is that it basically creates an environment where everybody is surveilled because there are also criminals in the society, which I find completely dis disproportionate. So it basically creates an environment where all messages or um, uh, uh, voice messages, um, uh, data on cloud storage, that everything, and we're speaking about private data, right? Private data private communication be between you and your grandmother. That is supposed to be surveilled and uh, by uh, automated technologies scanned for uh, child sexual abuse material. And we're not only speaking about um, hashing uh, or anything like that to find already existing material, but we also speak about detection of uh, grooming or ch children's solicitation uh, which basically means, well, <laughs> there needs to be some sort of an automated uh, AI mechanism to identify whether the content uh, that is there in the communication is child sexual abuse or not. Right, uh, well, that is a um, major issue from the privacy point of view, but also we have another problem because the commission put it in a way that well, end-to-end -end encryption also needs to be surveilled. How do you do that? Well, the solution is client-side scanning. And you know that, as open source developers, you know that if you have a piece of software that is broken, for instance, it looks um, into communication that it should not look into and does you know, things that you don't want the software to do, you can fix it. So this client-side scanning, is by definition, cannot be implemented by free and open source software. It can only be implemented by proprietary black boxes that basically do something with your data. 
you don't know exactly what it is. Y you cannot do anything about it. But it's very clear that free and open source software from this approach is a problem. And if the legislators think that free and open source software is a pro problem, then we have a problem, much bigger than this. Right. Um, are you depressed enough? Oh, the best is only to come. So, the Cyber Resilience Act. Anybody heard of that? Wow, cool. Couple, couple of hands. So, so the Cyber Resilience Act uh, shall establish a horizontal cybersecurity requirements for products with digital elements. What is products with digital elements? Well, that can include anything. Uh, software, hardware products, um, uh, remote data processing solutions, um, software and hardware components, of course, can be placed on the market separately. Um, and manufacturers will have to ensure that products put on the market are designed, developed, and produced in line with essential security uh, requirements as defined by the regulation. Well, that um, sounds fair, right? Um, but also um, becomes a bit problematic um, uh, when you, again, think about the free and open source software ecosystem. So um, manufacturers will also have to report actively exploited vulnerabilities or incidents having an impact on the security of the product within 24 hours to ANISA. Uh, and um, some conformity assessments will have to be done depending on the type of the product whether it's critical, um, uh, sorry, non-critical, or uh, class one critical, or class two critical, or highly critical. Um, right. Now, where's the problem? All of us want security, right? The problem uh, is that uh, there is, again, only a very limited exclusion of free and open source software. Uh, so it doesn't take into account uh, or in consideration non-profit entities or um, individual developers, uh, micro enterprises. Um, my main issue is that it is extremely difficult to explain to the legislators that there's a huge difference between an open source project that is somewhere uh, on the internet, on Git or uh, wherever, um, well, usually get today, <laughs> and a pro commercial product, regardless of the license, commercial product, and well, there are two very different, these are two very different things, and the obligations definitely should not lie with the free software developers. Right, um, so the exclusion is somewhat a bit in there, however, only in the non-binding binding part of the legislation which I find completely um, insufficient. Right. Now here comes the most scary part, the product liability directive, which is closely linked to um, the CRA. So the product liability directive um, foresees common rules on the liability of economic operators for the damage suffered by natural persons caused by defective products. Well, you probably know where I'm heading now. Um, so in this case, a product means software to operating system, firmware, computer programs, applications, uh, AI systems, anything. So manufacturers of a defective product, including individual developers or a defective component, can be held liable for the damage caused by a product and liable to pay compensation. So in other words, if you code something, put it on the internet, someone will use it and it will cause damage you can be held liable 
for the code that you have uploaded for free. I mean, this is a disaster from the free and open source software ecosystem point of view. So, right, what is the damage? Damage can be material loss resulting um, from death or injury, including harm to psychological health, uh, harm to property loss, or corruption of data. Well, for anyone who is um, developing uh, uh, file systems or uh, tools to check file systems, well, good luck with that. <laughs> Defectiveness is defined in broad terms uh, when the product, I quote, product does not provide the safety which the public at large is entitled to expect. And it refers to uh, reasonably foreseeable use and misuse. Um, right. Depressed enough? Again, there is some exclusion of free and open source software, so apparently those who drafted the text were somehow uh, aware, but definitely not sufficient. Now, so, uh, what can we do? <laughs> so, I believe that um, it is extremely important now to contribute to the public debate on that, to monitor the initiatives um, and uh, to make sure that the interest of free and open source software uh, community is represented at um, the legislation level. What is extremely important with these different initiatives is basically when, when is the deadline for amendment because that is basically the time where uh, legislators can table amendments to the, uh, uh, to the legislation and then the negotiation follows. Basically then the reporters, what they do is that they um, take all amendments and they try to build um, compromise amendments and then the negotiation starts uh, based on these um, drafted uh, compromise and amendments and the, uh, the tabled amendments. Now, uh, so uh, for chat control, which is uh, the ch child sexual abuse material regulation, well, I call it chat control because I think that um, term is much more descriptive. Um, is May for the Cyber Resilience Act, it's next week. And uh, on the PLD, it's uh, also the beginning of May. Um, maybe you want to take a picture if you want to know more. Uh, I'm not sure if the slides will then be somewhere on the web pages of the Linux App Summit. Um, but basically, um, the first link, oh, sorry, I <laughs> didn't put the QR codes there, but. <laughs> So the first link um, is, um, is a website or blog, blog, um, blog post of my uh, colleague Patrick Bayer, who is a German um, a member of the European Parla Parliament for the Pirate Party. And that, uh, the other links that I put there are links from organizations that you may know or you may be familiar with and that may speak in the language that you understand. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so it's, um, <laughs> well, I hope, I'm also trying to speak a language that people understand, but sometimes, you know, people with different backgrounds have um, um, a bit different uh, um, terms that they use. So uh, FSFE, I'm sure you know, uh, Free Software um, Foundation Europe, uh, and then uh, the Python Software Fund Foundation and also Eclipse. All of them have uh, posted some blog posts on um, the uh, Cyber Resilience Act or on the Product Liability Directive. Now, there will be a couple slides here where I think in each of the slides you may want to take the opportunity to take a picture because, well, if, if you want to help and um, 
try to convince the legislators that um, you know uh, some of the aspects of free and open source software um, ecosystem have not been taken into account, then, uh, well, of course, you can message any member of the European Parliament, uh, but also these are the most powerful ones in that particular legislation, because the legislation always has a rapporteur and uh, a set of shadow rapporteurs from each political group uh, that negotiate the, the legislation. It is very unlikely that um, um, amendments tabled at the plenary level uh, will be adopted once uh, these guys will find an agreement. Um, so, yes, uh, so chat control domain committee is the LIBE committee and you see my colleague Patrick Breyer is uh, in the negotiating team. Move on to the next slide. On the product liability directive, that's a joint competence actually of two um, uh, different um, uh, committees, uh, IMCO and jury. I work on that in the IMCO committee. So the, there is like a, the double uh, number of, <laughs> of the names because two committees jointly negotiate on the, on the legislation. And uh, then uh, on the Cyber Resilience Act, the main committee is the ITRE uh, committee. So it's um, industry, uh, research, and e energy. And um, then one of also the very important uh, opinion um, giving committees is the IMCO committee, where I also work on the legislation. So. Right. Uh, yes, yes. So, as I said, the most important from my perspective, if you got scared enough, is to get in touch with uh, politicians that negotiate on this, um, or um, and slash or um, organize within your free software community, join organizations uh, such as those mentioned, you know, um, in in debating this, uh, because of course they are also trying to um, lobby politicians in order to influence the legislation. All right, uh, so that's it. Um, for more information, of course, uh, I would be happy if you follow me on social networks. And in case there are any questions, I think we have uh, a lot of time. I'm not sure where exactly we need to finish, but it's like uh, 10 past or something, uh, right? We are, we, yeah, we are slightly early, so we have time for questions. So feel free to, hey. How receptive are MEPs to input from outside the European Union? Sorry, um, can you repeat? How receptive are the MEPs to input from outside the European Union, such as people in Britain? So, uh, so the question is, if, if individuals from outside the EU can provide input, is that, is that correct? Well, I mean, as a matter of fact, they could or can. <laughs> um, to what extent the MEPs will take it into account, well, is another question. But I mean, honestly, uh, if it's a reasonable concern, I think the MEPs should take it into account wherever it comes from, to be honest. So, well, they should think about the potential uh, issues that they are creating with the legislation. Whoever is the person that, you know, is saying, well, here there is something that you should pay attention to. Any other questions? <coughs> um, so my question is, is there any, like, petition sites that we that can be like access to maybe um, so we don't have to write emails to every single politician and be in fear that it'll just end up in their spam box, which <sighs> is like 50-50, <laughs> or they might ignore us. Well, to be honest, I do not assess the, the impact in the very same way. So um, 
There is a petition uh, on chat control um, that I know about uh, that uh, was started one of the Pirate Party members. On the, on the other initiatives, I don't know of any. I think it's a better you know, niche topic to bring up a pe petition. If you then have a petition with only a handful of signatures, it doesn't really help. Um, but if the MEPs get hundreds of emails uh, pointing at a particular concern, I think that is nothing that they could very easily just uh, delete the spam. So I, I think emails are fairly effective. Well, I mean, <laughs> the offices of the members of the European Parliament also have phones for those who are more courageous and want to have a fun conversation. I mean, uh, the thing is that you don't have to be really uh, worried about um, you know the discussion going into some uh, corner uh, from your perspective because well you are not negotiating anything you you are concerned citizens who want to just express their concern so it's very fair to basically say pretty much anything uh, well don't be rude but, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, even if your argument didn't make sense that doesn't really matter it's not 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 really a problem um, uh, the, um, the offices of members of the European Parliament um, have, um, uh, there are several assistants. So there is always someone on the phone, basically. Um, well, I mean, in the opening hours, of course, mm -hmm. not like in the midnight. Uh, you can hardly get uh, the MEP to the phone, but you can, you can give it a try, actually. I mean, uh, in the past, before I was a politician, I, uh, I, I I tried that a, a couple of times. I, I, uh, I was never lucky to get uh, an MEP on the phone. But also, you can, <laughs> if anyone wants to go to Brussels, you can knock at their office. That also works. <laughs> and that, that, well, that I managed, a, uh, that, that I managed to uh, organize a meeting with an MEP a number of times, to be honest. Um, I, I think a citizen coming over to Brussels to meet in person with an MEP is very, um, you know, a, a strong message that the MEP cannot, cannot really you know, refuse uh, su such an offer for a meeting because, well, that, that would be I incredibly disrespectful to the citizen. Um, but don't, I mean, like, if you are unable to actually uh, reach the MEP, feel free to talk to the assistant. Honestly, they know uh, usually a lot more about the legislation than the MEPs because, well, honestly, it, it's, it's just not in human capacity to, to understand every technical detail of a thick legislation piece multiplied by the number of legislation that the MEPs work, work on. So, so that's why they have policy advisors who are legal experts, who are exp experts in the area that the MEP focuses on and who help with that. And they really, like, um, pretty much in all cases, they, 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 they know more about the detail of the legislation than the MEP. I'm there in a second. Hi. Do you think it's, it's useful to um, reach out to the MEPs as a community? Or do you think it's more useful that we just reach out to them as individuals? Both. Totally, totally both. Um, as I said, there are organizations who have been reaching out. That's a, that's a, that's a good thing. Um, well, the major problem that, that, that I run into usually is that um, people don't understand how the European Parliament works. So that's why I try to also tell you, like, who are the, the people who, you know, um, are in charge? Who, um, what is the time frame in which it is, you know, needed to provide feedback? Because I, um, very often I run into people who would want to actually give feedback, they just don't know how. Um, but it's definitely both is important, both um, organizations uh, that you know organize people, communities uh, that they have some sort of a open letter um, that also works, all that 
but also individuals, because as I said, if the MEP gets hundreds of emails, especially if they are not copy paste, but you know, there are different elements in the email, uh, then actually they have to read it, right? Because if the email looks the same, then they will say, ah, okay, um, 258 um, example of the same email. And they don't know whether it was mass produced, uh, if, if the people are real behind the email, but if these emails are, well, different, then it's either ChatGPT or an individual. <laughs> The volume okay? Yeah. Uh, one question. So you've mentioned that you have feedback from organizations. Um, for example, our open source community, Citizens, which is sort of OSPOT-like mm -hmm. organization, um, you know, sponsors this event. Mm -hmm. Do you get feedback from these organizations as well? Also, Czech National OSPO is kind of being created right now. I think it would make sense to join with them and maybe approach the parliament through them. It would sound better. So do you see feedback yeah, from these? Yeah, I, well, not, not from your, uh, Nice, not, not, not nice com commercial, by the way. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, uh, but uh, I was in touch with um, uh, people from the Czech OSPO. Um, but to be fair, I mean, so, so there are two types of feedback that are needed. One is feedback to uh, MEPs in general to tell them, well, this is a problem because this will be a drag for innovation and this can effectively destroy uh, free and open source community in Europe. Um, second type of feedback, and that, that needs to be directed um, well to as many MEPs uh, as possible, the, uh, those who are, who are in charge in the first place. Not necessarily to me because I already know that. Right. <laughs> and there is a second type of feedback uh, which is suggested wording in the legislation to fix the issue. Because, well, I mean, <laughs> in the spirit of cooperation, uh, the more people, you know, come with ideas, the, the better probably we will table uh, the amendments. Uh, that I appreciate, for sure, and, and, and um, uh, for that, reason I am also reaching out to these uh, communities, uh, to these organizations, and ask them, like, so wh what do you think exactly, you know, should, how it should be covered out from the legislation, how it should be worded? Um, this is the tricky part, of course, but that, that, that is not what I expect from, you know, concerned citizens, because, well, I don't expect them to spend nights on reading the legislation that uh, says that this is defined if uh, assessment here in module A and module C and module H and whatever and yeah I mean like that that's a yeah <laughs> enough <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, I'll try to repeat, okay. Um, so I actually have two questions. The first one. You're making it difficult for me, okay. <laughs> That's the product liability directive, yeah. yeah. This one, does it apply even when the licensing of the software explicitly mentions that it comes without warranty? <laughs> well, that's okay. So the question is, the question is basically if the license agreements that can uh, uh, include a no liability clause can actually fix this. Uh, the answer is no, because the license cannot be above the law. So if the law says you are liable, you're liable, and you can write in your license whatever you want.
applied to non-European citizens producing software outside of the European Union, mm -hmm. but that software may affect citizens of the European right. Union. Okay. So the question is if the law also applies to non-European citizens producing software outside the European Union then is then used by European citizens, right? Uh, the answer is yes, because it's on the European market. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, now we're depressed. Um, well, the question is, what is the difference between an open source project and a product? From the law. From the law. Well, that's the major problem because um, I think all of us um, here agree that there is a difference between an open source project that you can found um, um, on, on your famous Git hosting. Uh, on, on your favorite Git hosting, or um, um, and, and a product that co also can include or can be built solely from open source software very easily. Um, that this is the problem. The the legislation uh, has some text that tries to exclude uh, open source projects by basically uh, saying that it should not apply uh, when it's not in course of commercial activity. Um, but the major problem is that this exception is, as I said, in the so-called recitals, which is a non-binding part of the legislation that somehow just should uh, provide guidance on the actual legislation, on the articles and cannot redefine what is in, written in there. So, well, that I find very shaky because um, then if it ever comes to a court, then the articles are the important part. So, I hope it answered your question. <laughs> it, it's extremely vague in the legislation. That's the problem. Sorry, sorry, can you repeat? Uh, for, for us to provide open source solutions that can compete with Project 71 for open source, but can our users be responsible as to not use that uh -huh. as part of their organization? How do you see the perspective of us uh, funding our, uh, our open source solutions to, to the European Union? Because I don't know that we <laughs> try to answer this question. Regardless of, regardless of what we spoke about in yeah. general? Not the part in general, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, my. Um, predecessor in the parliament, uh, German pirate Felix Reda, um, started a pilot project, then turned into a preparatory action, which is how it actually works, um, that uh, financed uh, bug bounties uh, that were run by the European Commission. So there was some sort of assessment of you know, critical software uh, that is uh, heavily used. And then you know, um, um, bug bounties were organized. I think it was even for new features. Uh, VLC, for instance, was part of uh, uh, that. Um, there were some prizes. Um, so, so that I think, you know, given that, given that there are pieces of software that are in widespread use, uh, so somehow, be, you know, become very critical. Remember of Hardbleed. Uh, then um, uh, I think it's also in the public interest to finance with public money. This what I what I perceive as a, a cult cultural heritage, uh, the open source code, uh, and, um, and yeah, and, and run initiatives that help this funding. So so this would be one could be one of it. 
Um, unfortunately, the pilot projects, because, well, by definition, there are pilot projects that are not supposed to be permanent. The commission then should, after the pilot project and the preparatory action, come to the conclusion, well, this is a really great initiative and we would like to put a permanent framework on that. Uh, so it's a bit now out of our hands because, uh, because the pilot project already has taken place and it cannot be prolonged anymore. But my uh, uh, project uh, with the open source catalog actually was inspired exactly by that because I was thinking, okay, so I cannot do the same thing, but what else can I do to actually help um, uh, adoption and better use of um, open source software? Um, so, so when it uh, comes to funding, I, I think you know that that could be one of um, I'm out of time. <laughs> so that could be one of the um, one of the ways how to get money. What I also think is that it, it's also I think good to think about how to maybe you know monetize the development of features, maybe some sort of crowdfunding you know, where people could actually crowdfund a particular feature, then, you know, we would put a goal on, well, in order to develop this feature, we need, you know, that particular amount of resources on that, that amount of time of a developer, uh, like human hours, which costs X, Y, Z, and we need that time in order to, um, uh, to develop that feature. So that, that could be, I think, another possibility how to organize around that. Okay, and because I'm out of time, I would like to thank you.